over the last couple of years, Two Sigma has, uh, um, I'll tell you a little bit about Two Sigma in a bit. Two Sigma has developed a fairly robust open source program. And um, in, in talking at length with Travis and uh, Brian and others, uh, I realized that our uh, open source program is kind of different to what goes on in the industry. Um, and I thought it would be useful to talk a little bit about how we landed where we landed with our open source program and what we think uh, companies and industry should bring to the open source community. Uh, and you know, specifically, we want to bring something that's complementary and uh, you know, in partnership with the open source community. So, so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today. Now, I apologize, but the focal length of my eyes happens to be kind of more or less exactly the, the, uh, the podium. So uh, my, I may well be kind of lifting up and down my glasses all the time. So, so really the goal of the talk is really to leave those of you in industry and especially those amongst you who are decision makers with kind of some ideas of why and how you should support OSS and how to do that in a way that's mutually accretive to both sides. Uh, along those dimensions of growth, benefit, profit, and really strength line, strengthens the underlying uh, key um, overlaps between uh, uh, the tech industry and, and the open source community. So uh, before I do that, I should kind of tell you a little bit about who I am and who Two Sigma is. So. Um, My name is Matt Greenwood, uh, and I work at Two Sigma as the Chief Innovation Officer. Uh, I'm really part of two distinct, fairly distinct worlds at the company. One is Two Sigma Ventures. That's our venture fund. It's a classic venture capital fund um, where we invest in companies at the intersection of kind of big data and AI, uh, classic seed and series A. And on the other hand, my, my role within the company is to run a group that we call Modeling Engineering uh, that, that designs and builds and maintains the tools that all of our modelers need to derive value from the world's data. So that was a bit of a mouthful, but first let me, I should step back and tell you what Two Sigma does for those of you who don't know. So Two Sigma is a technology company in the investment management business. And Fundamentally, we use science and technology and data to find value, find economic value in the world's data. So we are, have a large number of what we call modelers in the company who th think all day about ideas that might move liquid or illiquid markets. And then they take those hypotheses and they test them. And at Two Sigma, that means they find data sets, small to large, but kind of small is in the order of probably hundreds of gigabytes, so kind of large to large for many people here. Um, and they test those hypotheses, and if those hypotheses, statistically speaking, stick to the wall, then we will trade them. And the organization that I run, Modeling Engineering, builds all of the infrastructure needed to support those modelers. So those modelers are what everyone in this audience would call data scientists. And one of the problems that uh, we want to, we really seek to solve, is to make the, uh, the, the transformation from kind of brain to trade as, as, as easy as possible. There's a huge amount of kind of cognitive inf interference if you do data science on things that you don't really want to think about, like how do I set up my Spark cluster, and how do I turn on some box in AWS, and which language, which toolkit, and all of that is really peripheral to the question at hand, which is, does the weather in New York move liquid markets or some other hypothesis that you might have? We have a phrase for it inside Two Sigma, and we call it conversational research. We want our modelers to really have a conversation with their data to understand more about the data and more about their hypotheses and be able to get from idea to trade in as little time as possible because cutting down that time or Enriching that conversation eventually allows profit for us and support for our, um, um, for our uh, investors 
uh, many of whom are pension funds and endowments and, and, and large, large organizations. So that's what Two Sigma does, and that's what I do at Two Sigma. But my, uh, my, my interaction, my, my uh, involvement with open source goes back well over 20 years. I worked at IBM in the 90s, and I was part of the first task force to grapple with open source. So these were in the days before, you know, I don't know, it's kind of prehistoric to what we have now. And I was involved in many, many, many discussions about kind of who, what, and why to open source software. Um, and frequently found myself explaining to executives at IBM the important quote, which I'm going to quote like a hundred times, you know, free as in speech, not as in beer, uh, to explain, really try and understand what open source is all about. So many of the ideas that I have today, many of the, the ideas that kind of came into this, uh, uh, this, uh, this talk and what we do at Two Sigma were really informed by that time. And then by spending time during startups, I was in Silicon Valley before I came to Two Sigma. So, here we go. So I'm not going to tell you about why you should invest in open source. So if you're here, I'm making a tacit assumption, I'm taking it as axiomatic, that you already agree that uh, we should support open source software. In fact, uh, today, you can't really get away without it, right? Just about everything that we do in the world, it's fairly shocking, relies on some aspect of open source software. And part of this talk will be grappling with the hidden costs to what that means to an organization. So instead, this talk is really about how I think about allocating resources for open source software and how really does a large tech company invest in open source software effectively and derive value from the investment. So I'll be talking about some different ways we've gotten involved and use some examples uh, from the last couple of years. So actually, let me kind of begin at the very, very beginning before we get to this slide. So at Two Sigma, we are voracious users of open source, right? It's far easier to use things that other people have done than to build it yourself. That's like, that's an axiom in business, right? If you can get it cheaply or freely, why not use it? So by definition, we are voracious users of open source. Every company is, and as I said, you simply can't be a real company without being part of the landscape of open source or real technology company. And ever since the inception of the company, we've used and given back to open source. One of our earliest members of the company, one of the founding members of the company, is a core contributor to NetBSD. But as we grew our platform and solved the really hard problems that we have, we wanted to find a way of helping the community with some of our key, what we consider our key innovations. So the modeling engineering team as I said, his goal is to build a platform for these modelers, or in this parlance here, we're here to build a platform for data science. And that platform that we've built over the years includes a multi-language polyglot notebook, a way to discover data sets, an environment for building and testing models, easy access to scalable and distributed compute, and then the ability to publish and collaborate with peers. And a key component of that platform was a notebook called Beaker, which I announced here last year, has become an extension to Jupyter called, or a set of extensions to Jupyter called Beaker X. And so I think it's worthwhile just diving, you know, just a little bit below the surface to kind of explain to you the problem that we have that we wanted to open source, just to kind of give you an idea. So uh, you can, you know, anyone who wants kind of more than three minutes of this can check out my talk from last year where I spoke about this for half an hour about why we came to it. But really, what we see is that there are kind of a four cornerstones to a, any kind of data science platform. The first is you have to be able to find the data, which is fairly difficult even nowadays. Then you want to do some data analysis and modeling with partners who often don't speak the same language as you. You need that to be uh, computed, right? So, but you don't want to, no, like no, no one really wants to go to AWS and provision machines. Maybe some people here do, but like it's not. If I'm in the middle of a data science problem, I'm, I have no interest in provisioning a Spark cluster. So I need that to happen kind of magically behind the scenes. And then finally, and kind of most importantly, I need to be able to publish that in a way that everyone can understand it and actually everyone can replicate it, right? So this is kind of, 
maybe a step beyond open source software. This is about kind of open source science, right? So how do we do that? And at Two Sigma, that's really important because the models that we create are little pieces of research. We need to be able to replicate that research, not just to check that our assumptions are still correct year after year, but also because people move on. And when they move on, they leave their research behind. And I don't want models that are potentially providing millions of dollars to my investors to be kind of left ownerless or you know, at the worst, and maybe at the best, someone has to kind of replicate all the research. I want to kind of be able to push a button and still be convinced that all the research is there and be able to understand how the previous researcher did it. So, um, so those are the four, four parts. So we did this kind of very specifically and very intentionally um, because we wanted to bind in a kind of very freeing way. That's kind of a little bit of an oxymoron, but we really wanted to give all of our modelers the optionality of working the way they wanted, but bind them within a framework and an infrastructure that engineering control. So part of it is discoverable data inside, uh, inside JupyterX. So you can analyze the data. Uh, sorry, I'll take that back. I'm on the wrong slide here. So you can browse through data sets and drag and drop them straight into your Jupyter notebook. You can run analysis in, in many languages. Beaker had many, many more, but at the moment, BeakerX supports a, uh, a JVM backend, and so we've got kernels for Groovy, Scala, Clojure, Kotlin, and Java, uh, and SQL, and Magix, an auto-translation that allows you to run multiple languages in the same notebook and seamlessly communicate between them. And this is actually way more useful, even for a single person, than you might think. As an example, I was looking at some research recently that I did eight years ago. Okay, so I'll, I'm going to uh, uh, take a little dig here at uh, NumPy. So I did a research eight years ago in Java, and I had this piece of research in Java that I was replicating in Python. And uh, one key portion of the research was the ability to rank. So there are five different ranking functions. So ranking is you just take an ordered set of elements that are potentially weighted, and then you want to map them onto some unit interval with respect to a distribution, uniform, Gaussian, whatever it is. So there are five different ways of ranking in NumPy and SciPy and Pandas, and none of them matched my ranking function. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do until I realized, I remember that we have a JVM kernel. So I was literally able to cut and paste the Java code that I'd been running to rank next to uh, a tab I was actually, uh, I think I was running JupyterLab, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure, either that or just two different uh, tabs, and I was able to kind of feed the same vectors through to kind of understand actually what, what my version of ranking did. Uh, it was wrong, but it doesn't really matter. You still have to be quantitatively correct, even if it's wrong. So it's, it's kind of useful, even if you're a single person, to have these kernels. Uh, more than that, what we've done is we've built an integration into Apache Spark right in the browser. So assuming you have your cluster, this is, this is kind of step one of n steps, right? Eventually, you just want to push a button and everything gets done for you. But at least without leaving uh, the tab, you can uh, have some kind of control over your Spark cluster. And this is a way of just abstracting away the comp computation. And then, of course, all of the juicy things that you like that matplotlib gives you, kind of, but not really. Um, very, very dynamic plots and visualizations. And most importantly, the ability to plot dynamically um, data sets that kind of are on a nanosecond update or you know, very, 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 very large data sets in a way that doesn't just overwhelm the browser. <laughs> So that's the, the, the widgets. And then, so, so those are the kind of things that we, we deliver. And so you see that we have kind of very big eyes. We've solved a problem that we really believe is not unique. It's for the whole world. My solution of this, furthermore, if I give it to you, doesn't impinge upon my ability to make money. I'm happy for you to have the same, most of the same platform that I have. Um, we solve potentially different problems. And in any case, I believe that I solve problems 
with something that's kind of better than anyone else. That's why we make money. And so I'm happy to give away portions of a platform to allow other people to, to, to get more mileage out of their problems. So we have big eyes. Uh, and we kind of got there. All of this is, is not vaporware, it's all out there. You can go and download it. We're like 45,000 downloads or something I checked this morning, which is small, but we're, we're just starting. But really, a data science platform of this scope is really no small undertaking, and we can't build it alone. And one of the fairly scary things was the list of digital infrastructure that we fundamentally rely upon in order to get this platform out. And it's growing. And it's really way more complex to create a great open source project nowadays than it was five years ago without relying on some really large platform. And we kind of take it for granted that that large platform is just there, like the sun. Tomorrow morning, I get up, and pandas will just be there. And to a certain extent, that's true because it's open source. You can always get the source code. But if you pull the number of lines of code in the kind of data science stack of Python, that's an awful lot of code to look after if there's no one who's looking after it for you. So let's dig in a little on that. So we rely on this huge infrastructure. But how kind of how solid really is it? So on the, on the left, I th I'm not sure where this is. I think this came from NumFocus or from... It came from the NumFocus uh, annual report, right? So uh, on the left is pandas, and it's, 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 it's a great visual. I don't know if it's the Wes or Jeff being crushed underneath the pandas, but it's, it's got a lot of downloads, 27 million. Code base of 267,000 lines with 703 contributors over the years, but there are really only 10 core developers, and guess what? One of them is paid 20% time, one of them is paid 10% time, and eight are not paid for the time that they spend delivering updates to pandas. So, like, that's okay, right? Uh, you know, permit me to be a businessman, right? Like, that's cool. I'm getting money for nothing. Like, that's, that's really good. But there's a huge risk that I'm taking on, because if they're doing it for nothing, then tomorrow they might decide to do something else for nothing. It's the kind of the... Uh, the bus on the back, right? And so that's, that's a real problem for an organization to depend upon. And I heard recently, with, the other, with my other hat of the uh, uh, startup, that there is some company offering insurance on your open source, uh, um, depend, you know, on your open source dependencies. Sounds good, right? Like, you give me $100,000 and I'll kind of guarantee. And then I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, but wait. What are they hedging with? Like, how's it? It's really good when the money's coming in, but when you have to pay, like, what, what are they, they going to do? So, uh, so people are thinking about it. So if you look at Pandas and you compare the 30 million downloads and the 700 people and you see that there's only 10 core developers, they're not being paid for their work, you kind of got to think that, uh-oh, like, this is a problem we've got to think about. And it's easy to see that the current situation is... Uh, unsustainable, uh, especially uh, as a company in the finance space. My raison d'etre, my whole business is really all about understanding one thing, and that's risk. And let no one tell you otherwise. In fact, all of life is just about understanding risk. Because the better you can quantify your risk and the more accurate you can be about understanding your risks, the more risks you can take. Like, that's just kind of definitionally so. And so, you know, I would love to jump off in one of those squirrel suits off one of those high mountains. It looks really cool, but like, I don't understand the risk there. So I'm not going to take that jump. And we like to think that we understand the risk because maybe we're all developers and I've banged out code and Python in my life. Not really any good, but there are hundreds of thousands of lines of Perl littering around the company that I wrote once upon a time that people still curse me for. But our job in the finance space is really to measure and understand risks so that we can take better risks and get, hopefully, better rewards, because that's what it's all about. So how, how do you measure risk in an open source environment? So like, this is meant to go to the next slide. Here we go. Um, so part of it, I don't 
I don't dance like this. I sometimes do, but no, no, not today. So part of it is really understanding the full stack of technologies you use. And we don't even do that, right? Most of the time, how often did you do import foo and, you know, I don't have foo. Okay, Conde installed foo. And then I'm sitting there and it's like, okay, checking dependencies. And they're like, oh, I'll need 560 gigabytes to install the dependencies. And you're like, okay, well, I, got, I got that space. So you see this list. And it's like, oh, but some of these need more dependencies. And then I'm like, I'll go and get coffee. 15 minutes later, I come back and 400 things have been installed. I have no idea what they are. And, you know, there's, there's some amazing development going on to make sure that I'm not kind of, that I'm integrating the appropriate dependencies and I have everything in one nice environment and I can run multiple different versions, different environments. Like, it's actually pretty cool. We've done a good solution, uh, we've done kind of a lot of good work in kind of keeping dirty things out of our site, but they're still there. There's still dependencies. And so part of this is really understanding the technologies you rely upon. And that doesn't just stop at the code, but you have to kind of dig a level deeper, which is those dependencies that I'm relying on, what are they relying on? Like, am I at the bottom of my dependency tree? Is that like some project that some high schooler in Finland wrote in his spare time that someone picked up and now it's a dependency, a core dependency to my system that's trading? And it works as long as it works. And I remember once I was talking to a modeler at work and they had something and I said, you know, I'm deploying a black box for you. I just want you to know, like, I really, we should probably have a look inside it. But, you know, we're very concerned about IP at Two Sigma, so, you know, it's a long conversation. And the answer he gave was, it hasn't broken yet. So it's okay. And I said, really? Like, that's, that's the level of risk you want. It's all good. It hasn't broken in production. You know, history is replete with exactly that kind of a statement. It's okay until we lose a nuke, and then we're in trouble, right? So that's, uh, it's important to understand the people behind the code. And as we saw with Pandas, many, many open source projects, even the huge ones, are maintained by just a very small group of people. And if a core developer does move on to something else, the project is at serious risk. Jeff isn't here. He said he was going to be here, but I'll take a dig at Jeff. Like, what, we, what, what version of Pandas are we at? 0. Zero what? 0. 0. 0.23. That doesn't even start with a 1. It's, uh, how, how, how long ago did we start? 2011? It's a long time, and Jeff is an amazing guy. Wes has moved on. He's, he's able to transfer, but many, you know, there are, oh, there are very few big open source projects that have been able to, another one here, has been able to actually transfer appropriately. It's a, it's a hard thing to do because many of the key successful open source projects are bound up with the people who created them. So we have kind of orphan risk. We have changes in project methodology, right? So, you know, pan, you know, I'm picking too much on the Python Panda stack, but like project is going in one way, you get new core, core committers, they decide they want to pull the project another way. Many of the projects that we have are kind of organic growth. The rate of change of projects can kind of go up and down depending on how people excited are or whether they're in work or out of work. Uh, governance around open source projects really never actually gets to critical mass until the people running the project realize that, oh crap, we've got 10 million downloads, we should probably have some governance about like, how we roll things out. And so all of these you kind of have to factor into your thinking if you are in business. So as, a, as an example, this is one of the favorite examples that I have. Python 2 to Python 3, right? Advertised for what, like five years at least? 10 years maybe? Long time, right? 2003, we already had Python 3, right? At 2000 and what, 13, 14, we, well, we still have 2.7 and 2.8 littering, littering 2 Sigma. So this had huge ramifications at 2 Sigma, right? We, we didn't even start off as a Python shop, right? Because I'm a Perl guy, I'm that old. 
but by the time we came to kind of decide to convert to Python 2 to Python 3, we had hundreds of thousands of lines of Python written. And you know, no, like two to three is a great script when it works, but when it doesn't work, there is hours and hours of job, of migration, of maintenance burden, burden of things that actually people in business or maybe people who aren't engineers kind of don't understand. What do you mean? You're going to spend six months upgrading from Python two to Python three, or you know, that's a that's a kind of a nice, you know, could be even more than that. Yeah. So tell me about this Python thing. Well, it's an open. Wait, it's free. You relied on a free piece of software, and now you're incurring man months of work to upgrade. Was that really a good decision? Yeah, I mean, it probably was, but it's still an explanation that you have to make. So explicitly understanding the risk of migration and maintenance for a change like this are really crucial for companies who use open source software. So we've kind of thoughtfully and intentionally invested a rather large amount of time and brain power into planning a robust open source organization at Two Sigma. Julia spoke this morning about it, maybe she did. Uh, and um, to grapple with ideas like this. So, so we had kind of many, many, many meetings over the years. So Two Sigma, I joined Two Sigma in 2004, where you immediately start, or almost immediately started talking about it. Um, but you can see it took us about eight years to kind of figure out. Now, part of that is when I joined, we were a startup. And, Startups don't have the luxury of thinking about things like this, but by the time 2008, 2009 came around, we were a, a real business, and so we can start really thinking about what it means to give back. Um, and we kind of wanted to try and create some kind of process. So we're a, we're a heavily regulated industry. We're very kind of secretive. So what did we do in the early years? In the early years, we spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of energy uh, talking about something that I'm going to talk in about three slides of time, so I'm not going to talk about it now. Um, to, but we eventually developed this open source process. Now, at Two Sigma, we have a kind of very key understanding of a process, right? So kind of really you should only introduce a process if it kind of lowers cognitive overhead. Like if the result of having a process is I need to think less, then it's good. If it's not, then forget it. We shouldn't have this process. And for us, the ability to allow our developers to produce open source, to give back to open source project, is a big overhead. So we're a regulated industry, and there are all sorts of questions. Um, when you sign with Two Sigma, as you do probably with many, many organizations, when you sign your employment agreement, actually everything that you do belongs to Two Sigma, even when you're at home. So, so one question is, well, I'm at home on the weekend, and I'm doing a totally, you know, I'm, I'm like hacking away at my Alexa and I just want to put it on GitHub and like just let it be open source. How, how do I let my people do that really easily? I want to kind of give up my rights over the weekend. No problem. How do I allow people to give back to open source projects where they don't belong to us? So we are effectively giving up any kind of rights to uh, the patches that we're going to make. Right? We want to do that proactively and intentionally. And how do we kind of take something that we own and say, actually, here, it's for everyone? Those are actually really difficult questions, probably for any company, but all the more so if you're in a regulated industry and all the more so if you're in a secretive part of that regulated industry. So we spend a lot of time working with our legal teams, firstly, to understand the open source, uh, um, the open source kind of um, map and with marketing to collaborate to, to really minimize any kind of risks as we begin to put our open source contributions into the world. We formalized this approval process. We thought long and hard about bringing people from the company together to approve in a lightweight, uh, fast, but still kind of protective fashion. And then we also have what we call an open source thread at the company where that thread owns the open source strategy and community engagement because it's very difficult. If you're really going to engage with the open source community, you can't do it half-assed. There is nothing worse than an orphan page. You know, you go to some, do you have any Goldman Sachs people here? Okay, so you go to Goldman Sachs' GitHub page, you see GS collections, and kind of not much else. And you've got to think like, so what, do you, what image are you trying to show? that some guy really wanted to open source his collection, so you let him or her, but that otherwise you kind of don't care. And it's, it's really important. And one of the key lessons for us 
when we were doing open source, was kind of looking at other companies. And you know, some of them were really impressive. Netflix, for example, has a really impressive and robust open source uh, uh, persona uh, um, uh, uh, in, in, on, on the web. So, so we kind of started things up in 2012, 2013, 2014. Along the way, we found things, parts of our infrastructure that we really wanted to open source. So we open sourced Beaker, which was the precursor to uh, Beaker X. Uh, way back in 2013, that was the, kind of the guinea pig. Satellite, Cook, Flint, Waiter, these are all uh, really cool uh, open source projects. And I urge you to visit our GitHub page um, to kind of find out more about them. But they're all around that kind of data science platform. So, I'm looking in the wrong place. So this is a slide that we, uh, what was inspired by the Mozilla, the Eclipse Foundation, about kind of value and effort. So the deny, I don't think anyone's in the deny anymore, right? Maybe there are people who kind of take open source but kind of don't really think about it. They just kind of, but really you're kind of all, all, almost always in the use. So Two Sigma's founders had really strong ties to the uh, uh, open source community, and we were very immediately in the use and in the contribute, really. Holy moly. Okay. Contribute community. And we wanted to kind of move up that value chain. And most importantly, you'll see two things. Firstly, going up that value chain gets harder and harder each, with each step. So those kind of loops are meant to show the activation energy to get from one step to another. At the same time, as you approach open source involvement from a strategic kind of business-driven direction, your hidden risk decreases. So stage one was kind of use open source. And we do liberally all over our data science platform. Stage two is contribute to open source. And so this, we started off slowly. We, we gave patches back anonymously right at the very beginning. Over the last couple of years, we've become more active. And this is a picture of Lee, Lee Jin, who is uh, an Apache Arrow committer and uh, a Flint, uh, 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 pushed out Flint, which is our open source time series that runs on Spark. But he also um, worked with the Spark team to get the Pandas UDF featured in, in the Spark's 2.3 release. And there was a blog post about it, I think, last October. Uh, substantially improving UDF performance and usability, and I'm in incredibly excited to announce that he is a, now a Spark core contributor. So that's kind of really important for us, not just that we're involved with the community, but we're putting really good people, because we hire great engineers, into positions where they can help drive and influence the community, and I'll be fully, you know, I'll be fully open, influence the community for things that we need to do, because we need to get stuff done. So this is uh, so we we're, now we're all partners in crime, but we kind of need to be more than weekend hackers, and we firmly believe that to be model citizens, we need to do our share of leading. And what is that? So the conundrum is, how do you gain as a business by giving something away? That's kind of really the conundrum. And the answer to that is, if that's the way you think, then you're not evaluating things carefully. You're missing out on pieces that you're actually getting back that are really valuable to you, the intangible elements. And as we came to open source these, it was not without fairly raging internal debate, but uh, we eventually did, and it was a phenomenal thing. I came to meet, I flew out to California to meet Fernando, what was it, like last year or something like that? Uh, on the back of Beaker, which is the, the uh, notebook that we had built. And it was kind of amazing to sit down with Fernando and have, him have a real discussion about notebooks and to realize that he kind of knew who we were and what we were doing. And Polyglot, he was kind of fairly impressed with it. I was like, oh, this is fairly cool. Like we've kind of suddenly moved from being part of to helping to lead. And that really cemented our push from Beaker to Beaker X and really becoming part of the Jupyter ecosystem. So the next stage, the next obvious stage is kind of collaborate, right? So this is uh, the Pandas core committers. Uh, they were, this is last, last month, I think, uh, last uh, month in Austin, uh, working on a dev sprint. And kind of what's cool about this, Wes worked for Two Sigma until a couple of months ago. Jeff, who's in the bottom left, works for Two Sigma. 
uh, and the rest of the core committers. And so not only do we have a seat at the table, one and a half, I'll call it, where's an alum, right? So one and a half seats at the table, but we kind of bought the table. So we pay for the beer as well. And so you can get a lot of benefit by bringing something to the table besides human beings, which is real capital, which is something that we have to give. And maybe it seems not nice to say this, but like a lot of money for the people around the table is just not that much for a big organization. And so we can afford to really help the community in ways that are actually really beneficial to both sides. So uh, I got like a, a minute left. Okay, so stage five, the last one is the opportunity to redefine. I'm on a mission to redefine data science. And you can look up my talk from last year to understand kind of what I think. It's about actually not data science, it's about, as I said earlier, open source, open source science, if you think about it. Um, that opportunity only comes along if you've got all four stages. And when you get to this fifth stage, when you have the ability to help really drive not just the open source community, but through the open source community, everyone they touch, then I think that the benefits are you know, very, very tangible. So some thoughts on how, but I think I've covered most of these already, which is good because I've got about 20 seconds left. I think in terms of cost functions, and the key point that I made earlier is if you think that you're paying and not receiving, you've got the wrong cost function. So it's really important to kind of think through all of the costs and all of the benefits. And if I push out a piece of open source that five people are doing, so I've given up the ability to own it, but if it's good, I get 500 people work on it for free. Like that seems like a win to me, right? So there are some intangible benefits, some tangible benefits, and then there is some you know, monetary cost that you have in supporting the organizations. But it's important work. There's no question about it. We're only going to get from here to there by, by everyone bringing to the table what they can bring. And one of the things that organizations can bring is real capital, not just capital in terms of, of dollars, but capital in terms of humans as well. So, so our first foray, so we're trying to, you know, find the, the best place on this. Our first forays, we were wandering around this uh, uh, kind of desert. Now we're kind of more focused on, on the maximum, and hopefully we will be throwing lots of parties. And so what do we do? We've hired engineers in-house. So Darren's sitting in, in row three. Jeff's not here. Phil, these are core committers on Pandas and Jupiter Lab, um, and Lee Jin, as I said earlier. So one thing is to hire engineers in-house and have them work on those open source projects. But the thing is, they're sitting next to you, so they're kind of soaking in the atmosphere. They understand what Two Sigma really needs, and those things will eventually find their way into the core products that, that we're, we're, helping them, uh, we're helping them build. Uh, we, we've hired consultants, so that's an easy way of kind of pushing your bugs up the list. You know, I hate to say it, but if you want something done, money speaks louder than anything. And we had a really interesting conversation. It's not probably for now because I'm getting, uh, I'm getting the looks, but Wes was part of Two Sigma. He's no longer part of Two Sigma. You should go and read his blog post. It's a phenomenal blog post about why he started Ursa Labs. We're fully supportive, and we helped him start that uh, uh, startup. We're very excited about where he'll go and where he'll take Arrow and why he actually needs to be on his own to do that. And then finally, there are things like grants and fellowships that we have never given, but that's another way of getting involved with the community. And of course, the overarching one is to build a consortium. So we're very proud to be members of NumFocus and to kind of, through NumFocus, really fund everyone and really try and help NumFocus in a way that I think many of the people around the table don't have, which is bring kind of strategy and business sense and real uh, governance and kind of helping out uh, key, key, uh, um, key projects. So. Uh, finding a balance. It's really all about kind of balancing it up, understanding at every point your risk and finding the way through both your organization, because it's going to be hard, and also through the various open source community to kind of find a balance of not overwhelming the community on the one hand, but just being helpful and trying to work with them. And then, of course, we're back. It's free as in speech, not as in beer. 
All right, thank you very much.